whether we're an introvert or an extrovert, we can't completely be islands at work. And the employee experience can be such an amazing experience if you include others in that experience, whether it's within your organization, whether it's within your industry, and so on and so on. Our guest today absolutely amazes me in his ability to connect and reach out and to build community. Hold on, we're going to get into it. It's Relationships at Work, the Employee Experience and Workplace Culture Podcast. I am Russell Lulker here again, speaking to you about such things, loving it, learning so much. The guests on this show, I have been absolutely blown away at their brains, their time, their insights. And we're only, what, 20 so odd episodes in? I am, I'm looking at the sheet of people that I've talked to, I'm going to reach out to. I'm super stoked to uh, share that with you. And I will from week to week to week. You'll, you'll see. It'll be a nice weekly surprise. How's that? Another surprise for you. I created a thing and I really, really am excited about it. And I, I hope it is of value to you too. I've been really disappointed when it comes to employee journey interviews, because when I ask about them to people, they get this glazed look in their eye going, oh yeah, those, well, we do exit interviews. I'm like, okay, how about onboarding? Oh yeah, we, we ask a couple questions. How about stay interviews? Oh no, yeah. Oh, we do check-ins once a year. Like, it's just such a struggle, like pulling teeth for people to wrap their brain around this employee journey that should begin, have a middle and an end. So I talked to some HR professionals. I interviewed others who were looking for this kind of understanding of the experience. And I created the Relationships at Work Employee Journey Interviews. It's about entering the role thriving in the role and exiting the role. It is a holistic approach to that conversation and that experience. And you can download it right off russellolliker.com, my own website. It's one of the tabs even says download for your free templates right there. Easy peasy. Now, something that a lot of people do not find as easy is building community, networking, connecting with others. They feel like their employee experience probably could be better right? And what's not better with more people, like-minded people, people that provide value, people that can help you in your career and you can help them. Well, the man with the secret sauce, his name is Nate Brown. I'm, I'm happy to have him here. I've wanted him on the show, but I think he was kind of sheepish about being on because he talks about CX, customer experience. We're going to mention CX quite a bit in the podcast. He very much talks about that on stages, on podcasts, but he doesn't talk very often about his superpower, which is connecting with people, building community, networking. So he was a little nervous to come on, but he was really excited to get into this corner of his expertise that he doesn't get to share with others very often, but he did right here on this podcast. So I'd like to introduce Nate Brown. So let's get talking to him now. On the show today, we have the man, the myth, the legend. He's also not on video, so I don't actually know if he's wearing a hat or not, which he usually does in almost everything you'll see. You know I am, Russell. I've got my hat Perfect. on. Perfect. Okay, good. So theater of the mind. Imagine that Nate's got his photo, his, his hat on right now. So it's Nate Brown today, and here is why he is awesome. He is the Senior Director of Customer Experience at Arise Virtual Solutions, which is a platform that connects big brands with working from home service providers. He's also the co-founder of the CX Accelerator, which is a nonprofit community helping to equip, encourage, and connect customer experience professionals at every stage of their journey. He's been repeatedly named on top customer experience expert lists over the years. I even have shared a few lists with him myself. Indeed. Lucky, <laughs> lucky boy. Um, that more me than, than you. But I'm super thrilled to have him on because the man is connected. And uh, I think he's going to add a very interesting perspective to how we can sort of 
engage and connect with others to improve the employee experience. I'm going to shut up and introduce Nate Brown. Hello, sir. Hello, Russell. Thank you so much for having me on. I've, I've loved your podcast so far. You've come out of the gate swinging. Uh, so it's a great honor to be here. Thank you so much. I love that you put the caveat so far because you're just waiting me to <laughs> screw up. So I appreciate that. There's no pressure here. <laughs> So Nate, I want to start with the question I ask every single member of the of the show, every guest. What's your best or worst, one or the other, employee experience you've had in your journey? Oh, well, <laughs> I, I don't want to get like super, super deep on it. I mean, I, I had a situation, unfortunately, where I was a victim of uh, some psychological terror <laughs> in one in one job. And I was too young to identify it. So it was a really bad employee experience. And uh, I had to fight through so many things that I I was having trouble finding the words and being able to collect the self-awareness to really identify myself in the situation. But I had a really abusive boss. And so I, I, I worked for that individual for many, many, many years and gained a lot of scars from that. A lot of, a lot of things that I'm still healing from to some degree, Uh, but so much learning came from that. And it gave me such a heart to help people to understand when they're a victim of their job and, and to be able to accelerate out of that situation into a place where they can have a great, 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 meaningful work experience. It's interesting that you say that too, because I've spoken to a lot of leaders, management and stuff, and they're so eager to reset the clock and go, you know what? Forget the past. We have a new vision now. We're going in a different direction. Mm -hmm. We've learned from our mistakes. Forget all that. But people don't understand how trauma works. And it's Mm -hmm. interesting how you bring up something so much from the past and you say you're still working through it psychologically. So those scars don't just heal because somebody on a uh, agenda said, oh, we're moving on now because it says so on my checklist. So we're just going to move on now. Appreciate you bringing that up, even though it's a little painful. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it, to me, it manifests in the area of a lot of self-doubt. Like I just always have to be told, unfortunately told on a regular basis, hey, Nate, we see you. You're doing a good job. Keep it up. And And if I don't hear those words on a regular basis, I just devolve into a really negative place. And, and I, I have to tell my bosses that. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm hoping, you know, I'm hoping that over time I can mature to the point where I can identify within myself that the things I'm doing are good. And even if I'm not being told that, you know, in in a five, six day period of time that I can have the confidence to keep moving. But it reinforces the fact that leadership needs to understand who works for them, who who needs to hear what they need to hear. Uh, I've had staff that don't ever want the spotlight. They don't want to be recognized in any way, shape, or form. They just want to be in their little bubble, in their corner, doing their work. But others that do need that affirmation that that you're you're good, we can see you. But if a leader doesn't recognize that empowerment, acknowledgement is such a personal thing, then we're never going to get anywhere. Yeah. And and the best one I had, Russell, was getting to take part in what was called this global leadership program inside of an an amazing situation organization where I got to go and be part of this cohort of these incredible individuals who are on fire to grow and to learn personally and to serve the company in new and exciting ways. And we went into four different places around the world and we were just learning together throughout the course of the year and and that peer to peer connection, that galvanizing force of going through that experience together was unbelievable. Now that definitely lends itself segue into our topic today, which is all about Uh networking and connecting and community building. So was that done driven by you or was that driven by the organization you work for? What was the impetus for that? that? Yeah, the organization I was in at the time had a great program for those that they identified as being high potential leaders. So they were nominated to to enter into this program. It was a year-long program. And it was just a, a really neat deal to be able to accelerate your own learning. And, but also, I mean, the greatest thing that you came out of it, you read all these books, you did all these projects, this and that. But by far, the greatest thing that came out from that was the relationships that you had with 30 people across the world in that organization who, in, in many ways, they, they were just like-minded with you in the sense that, hey, we're not just here to do a job. <laughs> we're, we're here to, to serve people well. 
we're here to make something really special for one another and for our customers. And it was just such a breath of fresh air to be around those individuals. It, ele it elevated all of us together. Say I'm an alien coming from a different planet, don't know our customs. How would you explain to them what networking is? Yeah, I mean, networking is just simply, I love how Steve Jobs talks about the more dots that you have to connect, the more creative you can be. So when you have more dots, <laughs> you can create all these fascinating shapes and constellations and connections and, and be more creative and have more influence than you could have ever had if, if you had a small number of dots. So networking is simply getting more dots. Hmm. In okay, interesting. Now, I want to sort of wrap that in value, though, because it feels like you're just a collector that's collecting dots as opposed to... Sure. Um, and because you talk about the global leadership program as something where you kind of found your people, you were feeling such a connection, which feels like such a bigger leap than the Steve Jobs uh, definition. So yeah, how would you describe it for you personally, though? Because there is I've seen such great benefit to your own career. Yeah, no, great call out on that, Russell. I mean, if, if we think about it as a constellation, you have stars that are so far away, you can barely see them. <laughs> And it's going to be hard to connect with with those dots. But then a, a strong network is those where the stars shine brightly. And that requires you to, to be close. It requires you to be close enough to see them, to hear them, to be to understand and be a part of, of their lives. And, and you are helping to generate mutual value there. But but even more than that, I mean, I, I love Keith Ferrazzi, Never Eat Alone. Have, have you seen that one, Russell? I, not off the top of my head. So, I mean, it's it's just a, a really great resource on this topic. And if, if you're interested in extending your network, creating a, a more meaningful network experience, that that is the number one resource that I would recommend. But he's just got this great model of, hey, I'm going to identify who I want my stars and my constellation to be. And I, I'm just going to go through a cadence where I, I'm going to connect with them on a regular basis and send them an article, uh, just ping them and ask them how they're doing. Uh, but just just give value to them, knowing that value will be reciprocated. But it, it's not necessarily about that reciprocation. You know, there's there's the genuine way of building a network, and and it's gonna be it's gonna look and feel different than a person who is generating a network selfishly, <laughs> with with the intent of of gaining their their own extension of of a pedestal, uh, versus somebody who is building a network because they care about the people in it <laughs> and, and they want to see them be successful. It's just a totally different mentality. And I feel like for us, Russell, that are in this, this space of employee experience and customer experience, we, we have that, that true authentic desire to see others be successful and, and to be able to help them to have great experiences in, in their life, in their work. And, and if we can be a part of that, then, I mean, that's really, really intrinsically meaningful, meaningful for us as well. Would you say there are different types of networking? Because, I mean, I look out and I see my very substantive net, substantive, I'm going to get words on the show and I'm going to say word of the day, <laughs> a meaty, a meaty network. But there are different levels to it as well, because I know others that are much more on the personal side, others that are different levels of acquaintances, others where... I'm not sure really why they're in my network, but I like them as humans. So <laughs> how do you define or sort of approach the different levels of networking or, or how has it worked for you? Yeah, I mean, so on the, on the top of that, you certainly have different types of connections with, with different people. And one of those type of connections, like I, I have my own personal board of directors, you could call it. I mean, these are, it's a wide range of mentors that I have. I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer and having a multitude of counselors, <laughs> to use the proverb, uh, that, that speak into your life. I mean, there's just a lot of a wisdom that, that comes from a multitude of, of mentors and counselors. I was actually photographing an event, uh, and Dave Ramsey was there, and he was talking about that principle. He's like, I have a mentor that helps me to be a better father. I have a mentor that helps me to be a better husband. I have a mentor that helps me to be a better a business person. I have a mentor that helps me to be a better pickleball player. Like, and, and so in all these areas in his life that are meaningful to him, he's got somebody that, that's helping him along in those areas. So I've, I've tried to adapt that, that principle as well and, and to have that, that board of directors. So, but then 
moving down beyond that, I mean, we want to have people that, that we're connecting to as well, where we're investing into them and helping them to grow some protégés. And, and if there's not a lot of that, where, where you're getting that opportunity to share and help others to grow, then, then you're stunting your own growth. Because, I mean, there's just a tremendous thing that happens, a galvanizing effect that occurs when, when you have that, that potential, that capability to equip others and to help them along in their career. And, and that's really where CX Accelerator came from. I mean, it was, that was me feeling really lonely in, in the work that I was doing as a CX professional. You know, at the time, there wasn't CX being done inside of that organization. It was me forging a new path inside of that organization. And I felt very, very lonely in doing that. So I was like, you know, let, let's create some community around this. And, and there was to some degree out there, but it wasn't the type that, that, that I, I needed personally. And I, I felt like others could benefit from a different type of, of community as well in the customer experience space. So that's where CX Accelerator came about. And it hit the mark really quickly, really well. I mean, people needed it. I, I wasn't the only one. Do you think there's something to the 150 rule, that belief that you can't have meaningful connections with more than 150 people? Because oh, I think way less than that. <laughs> Fair enough. And and but to somebody from the outside looking in and sees myself or you online and looks at the amount of connections, I'm talking the vanity metrics of social media. Yeah. But from the outside looking in, they're like, "Wow, you network and you know a lot of people, but can you really know and network with?" people beyond 150. Mm, yeah. Oh gosh. You know, it's, it's funny how cyclical some of those, these relationships are in our lives. I mean, we'll all go through full seasons of, of several years where I don't interface with somebody. And then all of a sudden they come back into my life and, and it feels like we didn't miss a beat. Right. And we're able to, to help one another or just to encourage one another, just, just enter back into one another's lives. I feel like I personally have the, the capacity for that. I'm open to that. Whereas my wife is not, she is not open to that. Like she has a small group of like 75 people. These are my people. And, and that's, it. I'm going to invest deeply into them. And, and I think, I think there's tremendous power in that. I, I don't fault that mentality at all. It, it, it's, it's kind of different in terms of how we are different. I grow, I draw so much energy, Russell, from being with groups of people. I love, I love that. I loved being at CCW Vegas last week. I was a kid in a candy store rock, walking around that expo hall with 3000 CX professionals. I was beaming just walking around. So I, I draw a lot of energy from that situation, whereas my wife does not at all. So I, I think we need to understand our own capacity for relationships. We, we want to make sure that they're meaningful and that they're giving us energy, that they're giving us life. So if they're sucking you dry and you dread looking at your phone <laughs> every moment of the day because of who's going to be pinging you or texting you or whatever, then it's time to scale back. And I can, and thank you for that because I know some people listening are introverts and they're not going to pull their energy from large groups of people. They're going to pull it from being by themselves and recharging before they go out and make those connections. So to see that juxtaposition between the two, it's still really important to network, but understand where your boundaries are. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. And and I, I spend a, a considerable amount of time alone in the woods. <laughs> so that's like a different type of energy that, that I draw. Uh, but I, I do think it's, it's a question of if, if I have, all these relationships, is, is, is that stressing me out or is that exciting to me? And, and I think we have a, a different limit there. For, for me, you know, I, I do have a, a selected group of, of people who, who I would say kind of, th this is my tribe. These are my people. And, and I love, love, love that book, Tribal Leadership as well. And it, it talks about how it, it's somewhere between 75 and 150 people it, is their rudimentary calculation. Of, of how many meaningful relationships we can juggle. And they, they define it as like, I know that you have a dog and I know the name of your kids and I know you're into kayaking and fishing and, and boom, we, we at least know each other on a human to human level, but there, there should, and there could, and there needs to be like 15, 20 people that are your true friends. And, and that's in a professional sense. Like I I've got like my 
my people. And that really has been forged in, in my experience through CX Accelerator. But however you gain that, um, having a couple folks, a, a handful of folks that you're really sharing life with, uh, get, being very vulnerable with knowing your ups and downs that you're experiencing professionally and that you can trust them with that. Um, but then even beyond that, Russell, I mean, I love the Gallup Q12 question of, do you have a best friend at work? H have you ever seen that question pop up? I have up? a few times, actually. That's funny you bring it up. I think I used to hate that question. I thought it was so stupid. That question's brilliant. I mean, it's, <laughs> it is, it is the, the most meaningful thing as far as employee loyalty, as far as connecting you into a working environment, having one person that you are extremely connected with. It will make or break your your work experience in so many different ways. And, and I felt this very poignantly recently. I, I had my best friend leave the organization and and the wound of that was was deep. I didn't even expect it. I didn't see it coming. It was like, oh my goodness, I feel so lonely. And, and I have some good friends. I have some good connections. But that one individual is so important to our work experience. So I'm looking for the benefits of this because, I mean, I've heard a few things. You're talking to expand your network, to look beyond, even when you start with best friend to bigger circle to bigger circle to bigger circle, you've got mentorship. You've mentioned feeling lonely in your work. So trying to expand even beyond your own industry to, to grab on to more like-minded people. What other benefits are there to building a bigger network than just the, the team in which you work in? It's fun to just get to celebrate what, what's happening with others as they succeed. So when, when you're a part of more, when you get to see more that's going on, it gives you a, a greater capacity to celebrate others. So, I mean, that, that's a tremendous thing right there. I mean, that's a lot of serotonin <laughs> that's flowing through your network and through your community if, if, you, if you have that ability to see what, what's going on and, and celebrate with them. So that would certainly be one. But then, I mean, the, the, there's the obvious of it just gives you more exponential capability to, to, have, to have influence and to be a part of meaningful things. I mean, I've, I've had so many intriguing requests <laughs> over the past couple of weeks. Hey, could you, could you write this? Could you be a part of this project? We have this CX World Games going on. We have a brand new idea. We want to run this by you. We'd love for you to be a lead with, with this new concept that we have going on had an amazing conversation yesterday with somebody very close to me who wants to run a CX event in Nashville and wants me to help host that event. I mean, these are things that I love. I love getting to do stuff like that. And there's no way that I would have the opportunity to do that if, if I wasn't really close with these individuals and if I wasn't doing things also to pour into them and to help them along the way as well. I mean, so that that's very much been the case for me. It's it's a reciprocal thing that happens, but it's an overflow of authenticity. I mean, people can feel it so clearly when you're just surface level helping them in in hopes of being helped back. But when you're really investing in somebody with with no expectation of return, it's amazing the things that come back to you. I just wrapped up uh, Alan Grant's book, Givers and Takers, Give and Take. And this definitely yeah. lends itself to that, which is people can see it, can generally see a taker and that have an agenda when they're trying to mm. expand their network or what's in it for me or their cold call, LinkedIn, direct messages. Or the other side, which is much more the giver, which is what you're talking about, which is I'm just here to help. I'm just here to connect. I'm here to learn from you. Case in point, Nate, I mean, this podcast has been fueled by a thankfully amazing network that I've been able to build over the years. I reached out yeah. to you and asked if you wanted to be in the podcast. You're like, no, but I have somebody named Keith Komet who'd be amazing to be on. And he was. And then, you know, <laughs> then I followed up and they're like, well, I want to be on the podcast too. And look how that worked out. <laughs> Did I say no? I never meant to say no. I'm sorry. No, I, I think it was a no. It was a maybe, <laughs> but Keith's better. Go go talk to Keith. Keith is better. He's amazing. <laughs> I, I learned so much from Keith every day. <laughs> Keith is phenomenal. But it does also reinforce that opportunity, collaboration can come from having a network, even if Nate, yeah. we've never met in person, but yet we've been, you know, circling each other for years. True. It's it's just also feeding that network and and 
continuing to make sure that it's still alive, that you'll benefit from it. I'm, I'm literally holding in my hand, give and take by Adam Grant. I think, I think it's a wonderful book. So I'm so glad that you found that one as well. Except I'm the idiot that called him Alan Grant. So needless to say, <laughs> his name is Adam Grant. He's amazing work life. That's a podcast. I couldn't stop listening to if I tried. So <laughs> You've, you've got the groundwork that, you know what, I need to expand my situation at work. I'm, you know, by myself I ha or, or, or I have a team and I'm not feeling quite connected. How do you start building a network? What are the steps? You kind of alluded to sort of reaching out and asking for help, but I just want to know if there's like three quick things you could start to do to build that network. But I, I think that's a great question. I, I think you also raise a wonderful point, Russell. I mean, there there is the in your organization network, and then there is the beyond your organization network, and both are so 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 important. I mean, there, there's some great research recently from Tiny Pulse, which is a pulse survey uh, tool, talking about how you know we always say Russell that you don't leave a job, you leave your boss. Yes they kind of put that on its head a little bit and they actually talk about how peer to peer relationships are even more important than the relationship to your manager. Okay. And, and I've, I've personally really felt, felt that like if, if you're in a good team of people and you're just in the trench together, you're doing the work together. That is, that is incredibly galvanizing as, as an employee in terms of your loyalty, your ability to work well, and it's, it's really the job of the leader to foster that environment where those great peer-to-peer -peer connections can really happen. Uh, so, the, I mean, that's that's the first tip is like, hey, look around you. <laughs> Do you have great relationships with the people that are, are seated around you or that are you're working in a team with if you're in a remote employee? It, it really does start with, with that peer-to-peer -peer relationship level. You'll be so much happier in, in your role, if, if you have great connections with the people that you serve alongside every day. So identify, be courageous in identifying what those hurdles might be there. Maybe there's some self-awareness that, that needs to come. You know, ask somebody that, that's a trusted person to you, hey, is, is there anything maybe relationally or, or just personally that I'm projecting that I'm putting out there that might be dismantling my relationships to some degree. Uh, that was me. That was me for a long time where I was putting out this almost a vibe of desperation and defensiveness when it came to customer experience to my peers. I wasn't gaining influence with them I, I, and I didn't have very good relationships with them for a, a period of time uh, because I had become so focused on achieving CX success, but it was way too centric on me. It was a very selfish mentality. So I, it, it took a mentor who who kind of hit me in the head a little bit and said, "No, we got to break this down. Like you're not you're not going to war. You're, you're coming into an, a, a building of people that want to serve alongside you, and you need to change your mentality around that." So I mean that that would be the first one. Then as you start to extend externally out there. Just think about the things you're learning. I mean, that, that's the first thing I did. And it was Jenny Dempsey and Jeremy Watkin who got me out there originally because of their brilliant Communicate Better blog. <laughs> and, and they were just so authentic in their writing style. It's like, hey, this is, I just had this happen today. And I learned this from that. And, and here's how I think we can do customer service even better from this thing that, that we learned here. And I was like, oh, gosh, you know, there's so many things that I'm having happen right now where I'm learning. And, and I want to be able to extend some of that learning outward towards a community that's out there. And Jenny and, and Jeremy were so gracious to let me collaborate with them on some early pieces and just kind of pave the way to what it would look like for me to flip the script a little bit in terms of consuming all this knowledge versus starting to give some of that knowledge out to, to the community. So, I mean, that's step two. What, what do you have to offer? What do you have to give that would help to equip and ad admonish the people that are within your realm of work, whether that's service or CX or not? You, you, you have something incredibly unique to you that, that will help others to accelerate on their career journey. What, what would be the best vehicle in which you could start to offer that up? And then as you do that and as you find your voice, there's going to be people that surface up that are your people. That, that you get to connect with, that you get to connect with. It's an honor. <laughs> it's a privilege to identify those people. And I have made incredible, incredible friends through this journey of starting to give, give information, give 
a voice out into the CX space and, and the return that has come back in the form of these relationships it is something that that is so so wonderfully valuable and then the third one would just be <laughs> just just keep keep doing it just keep that that idea of i i'm going to continue to learn and to grow so keep feeding yourself keep reading keep learning <laughs> just because you've started to contribute doesn't mean you stop learning. I think a lot of people make that mistake where they're like, okay, well now I'm a quote unquote thought leader, whatever that means. And so now it's time for me to just think, I'm going to think outward towards others, but I'm not going to let them penetrate the way I think. No, 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 no. Keep that curiosity alive. Keep, keep allowing others to invest in you and keep that authenticity going in terms of, wow, I'm, I'm still learning. I'm still growing. Now, that's why, Russell, I love calling myself a student of CX. I am not an expert of this work. I am never going to claim to be an expert of customer experience. It's too hard. I am not smart enough. There's no way I'm going to truly understand the depth of this work. But I am growing a lot. I'm learning from a lot of really smart people. And in that process, I'm giving back into the community. And, and it's been a wonderful cycle. I think you touch on something, too, throughout the thread of that which is understanding that in order to network at the root of it, it's not about you. It's about the people you're trying to network with. It's about being curious. It's about understanding yeah. the value you can bring to them. But a lot of people feel that networking is such a, a central centric sort of thing. Like what am I going to get out of connecting with all these people? What if I hand out a hundred business cards at the latest conference? That's networking, Nate. <laughs> So I, I like the idea of curiosity, whether it's within your own team, whether it's somebody in your industry, like you were mentioned with Jenny and, and Jeremy, and then even further out. So I, I love that through light, even though you sort of didn't say it, but it definitely was in the DNA of it, which is curiosity. Oh, I, I love that word curiosity. I think that's one of the most undervalued superpowers that we have as, as professionals is to generate that sense of curiosity and excitement about the work, to use uh, a phrase from Prime to Perform by the, the brilliant uh, Lindsay McGregor and Neil Doshi, uh, incredible resource on intrinsic motivation and peer-to-peer -peer relationships. So I, I think you're spot on, Russell, with that. And, and your, your, uh, your visual that you're giving me around how most people, when they think about their network and they think about that constellation that we talked about before, they think they think they're the sun. Yes, <laughs> they put themselves right in the middle. No, no, no. The the sun of a network is is that core of what you all together are trying to accomplish. I mean, in my mind, the core of my network is the growth, the admonishment of CX professionals to meaningful career journeys. That's the sun. So all of us together, we get to circumference that sun, and and different people have different ways of of being a part of that constellation. Uh, but I'm I'm not at the center of that, nor should I be. That could also be values as well. N not only such a, a common theme yeah. like CX or for me, employee experience as well, but also that common themes of courage, integrity, um, mm. uh, mentors that you all find that affect you and speak to you in a different way. That commonality that, that Certainly. I mean, there are people that I won't reach out to because I know I don't share the same values as them. Not yep. only will I not be able to feed their network, they won't be able to connect with me. So it's, it's really understanding it's networking is such a personal thing. And I don't think people realize that it's about the people, not about the constellation as it were. Sorry, Steve jobs. Mm. No, very, very well stated. I love that. How do you know it's working, Nate? How do you know that you're feeding the garden, that the plant is growing, that the const <laughs> let's keep the metaphor going, that the constellation is breathing, I guess, is is glowing? How do you know you're doing it? Well, I, I do think the garden metaphor is, is more apt in, in this in this question, and, and it would be one that there's fruit being generated, that there is value that is being generated, where you are you are being told by others that you are helping them. Hey, th thank you so much. You you connected me with this person. I got a new job because of that. Or or I I read this thing that you wrote and and I was able to approach my situation completely differently and have this level of success uh because of that. Or or just uh just the idea of hey, I thank you so much. I I was feeling really lonely 
and and you you kind of came out of left field and connected with me. We had this great conversation. Uh, you don't even know how much I appreciate that. So if, if you're not hearing words like that on on some kind of cadence, then then maybe maybe assess if it's time to give a little bit more or give to different people in different ways. But then also, you know, that fruit should be showing in your own life as well, where where people are coming to you, they're approaching you with with different opportunities and ways to further your connection with them, ways to further that partnership with them. Um, so it shouldn't happen every day, every hour, but you know, it should happen once a week, you know, once every other week at least, where where you're somebody's approaching you with with an opportunity or an idea or a suggestion or an interesting conversation. They're just wanting your thoughts and perspectives and opinions. And that is a result. That is a privilege that comes from you investing inside of them. So, I mean, that, that would be certainly one way to know how it is working. It is not goodness. It is not the number of followers that you have on Twitter or, or LinkedIn or Instagram or wherever the heck. I mean, th that has nothing to do with the quality of a network. I, I, I hope that people are starting to realize that. I think that they are. Uh, for for too long, I was chasing numbers on Twitter and I, I mean, it just, it all came crashing in on me years ago where I was like, this is stupid. I mean, this does nothing to generate value to me or anybody else in the world if I have X number of followers. I mean, you, you can literally just go out and buy a bunch of bot followers and make yourself look great if, if that's your goal. But if your goal is to actually impact lives in a meaningful way, then you got to focus on the quality of your network. It is so little to do with the size of it. So say you're approaching somebody for the first time, Nate, if you're wanting to expand your network on some of those platforms or even through email or in the hierarchy of the organization that you're in, what is the water to watering that garden? What are you reaching out? Like what is in that first email or first contact that will nurture that network? Usually what somebody would say here is, oh, well, you have to think about what problem they have and what keeps them up at night and then think about a way that you could help solve that problem. That is true. And and that does like, quote unquote work. But but for me, I'm going to I'm going to try and make their life a little more interesting. <laughs> and I know this is a me thing, Russell, but like I love just bringing a, an, an atmosphere of, of mystery and excitement and just showing up kind of out of left field, as mentioned. And uh, hey. What's going on? Have you have you ever thought about this? Have you ever seen this? Have you ever read this book? This is so cool. I think I think you might love this. By the way, I love that shirt you're wearing. Do, do you play badminton? Because I th I think you'd be really good based on your reach that you have on your arm length there. Like just <laughs> like I I love like at at this conference at CCW last week. Like I just loved generating interesting conversation that people didn't expect and and that would come at them in a different way. But it always came back. To, to my core of, hey, let's let's keep growing together as CX professionals. You know, I'd always find a way to come back to that. Um, but I, I just I just love making people smile and encouraging them and, and making their day a little bit brighter. So that, that's my thing. So think about what your thing could be. What can get in the way of building networks? I mean, we talk about how easy it is. Just message, just email, just reach out. But it's not easy for a lot of people. So what what is some roadblocks to building a bigger network as an employee, as a as someone in an industry? It's time and bandwidth for sure. I mean, you're going to have seasons in your life where you need to hunker down. <laughs> you need to turtle shell in and you need to take care of you, take care of your family. It's going to be really hard for you in those seasons to give and extend outward. And, and that's okay. And hopefully you have some people that are really close to you. This is that moment where having that really close group of friends is so important so that they can help you through those seasons of time. That That's not the time to grow the network. Um, so th that's going to be uh, something that's true in, in, in everybody's life to, to varying degrees. So just, just honor that, you know, just identify that for what it is. This is not a time where I need to be investing bandwidth and energy outward. I, I do need to invest inward right now. I need to ask. <laughs> I need to draw some people close to me to help me to, to overcome this. But then when you, when you exit out of that season, when you overcome that, that obstacle, that season, that even that mentality and, and you're back, then, then be back, you know, go, go out and have the courage to jump into 
that event that you talked about attending downtown for that product meetup. I, I just got to do that a couple of weeks ago. It was, it was a tangential thing for me uh, to, to attend this uh, product meetup group at the Asurion office. And it was amazing. I was blown away by these product leaders and how customer centric they were and, and, the, and the ways that they were thinking. It was such an encouragement to me. So having that, having that bit of courage to, to try something new and, and put yourself out there in a bit of a different way, I think that will just, um, it'll be a snowball rolling down the hill. It'll just continue to accumulate in a really good, positive way. What advice would you give to someone who might be in a hierarchical organization where there are gatekeepers, i.e. you're trying to build a network, but you need permission to talk to that person in the org chart? Like it is sort of a clamp down on your ability to reach out, connect, have a conversation. What would you say to mm. that person? Yeah, I mean, that shows so much about the culture of that organization, unfortunately, where, where they wouldn't be breaking down those barriers and, and trying to create good relationships, you know, across the organization. I feel like most organizations are waking up to the importance of that and, and bringing some of those barriers down. Um, but they're still going to exist. If if, if nothing else, they'll, they'll exist psych psychologically, even if they don't exist formally <laughs> in, in different ways because procedures or process has changed. There, there's still that idea of, of this person is is removed. So, I mean, the thing that jumps out in my mind, Russell, when you ask that, when you ask that is connect with the people around you really deeply and really well. Just invest in the in the people around you. And in doing that, you will earn opportunities to, to invest upward as well and, and sideward and downward, whatever word you'll see those opportunities. If, if you're faithful with the relationships that you're being given, your capacity, your ability to extend those relationships outward is, is absolutely sure to come. I I've seen that happen with so many of my peers in organizations like that, uh, where, where they were happy, they were creative, they were connecting well with their peers and then what happens is they they get their executives curious about them. And all of a sudden they're being invited to go attend this hockey game or, or do this or do that because they can see the excitement of this person. They can see the great connections that they're creating and, and that makes people want to connect with them. So So I think to summarize that in a much cleaner way, be a magnet. Make people want to connect with you. COVID is certainly made us more understanding of the virtual world versus in person. And now in persons are, are certainly coming back. I was in a conference in person in Dallas just a few months ago and you were in Vegas. Nice. But it, you know, it, it's certainly shown that virtual world is a way that a lot of people connect. I mean, that's certainly how you and I got to know each other. Is there much of a difference yeah. in networking and being proactive in networking between the two? Well, I do think that there has been a, a bit of a change that has occurred here and, and accelerated through this pandemic stage. And it's this this forging of micro communities. People are desperate for a virtual tribe that is of that size, Russell, that we were talking about before, <laughs> where you can have 20, 50, 100, 150, even upwards of 250 meaningful connections with people. They're, they're trying to, to make actual friends. Uh, I had the, the fascinating experience not too long ago. I was photographing a wedding and the groom was meeting several of his groomsmen for the first time in person because they had played video games together, which a video game is simply a community, whether it's uh, Overwatch or, you know, whatever it is, uh, Rocket League. You know, if, if you're playing this game with the same people in the same context in the same virtual environment, what, what you have there is a community. And so, I mean, they had an incredibly powerful community. You would have never known that they weren't best friends, you know, growing up in the playground, you know, for, for life. Uh, so people are seeking virtually those type of connections because they haven't been getting it the same way that we used to growing up, Russell. Uh, that there's just been a, a change in our society in a lot of ways in terms of <clears throat> where the connections come from, where our friends come from. So they're seeking that idea of, I want to be known. I want to be loved. I want to be cared about. And they're trying to find that in virtual environments. Well, you're not going to get that on Twitter. 
you're not going to get that on the, the, the behemoth that is Facebook and Instagram necessarily. You, you might get a couple great relationships there, but you're, you're going to find that in these smaller micro communities. So, so people are morphing towards that. And it does kind of change the way that we interface and, and create spaces for, for people to be able to forge a virtual connection. What are some tools mm -hmm. or platforms that I could be looking at to go, okay, this is a good springboard to finding these communities, to build my own community, to find my people? I love Gather Town. It's just a really fun, simple meta environment in which you create whatever you want. And inside of CX Accelerator, we created a giant castle. And people can wander around and play play games and talk about things that are interesting to them and in different areas inside of the castle. As soon as you approach somebody, just like in real life, it, it pops up with the video connection. So you're, you're, you're having organic collisions in a really fun and exciting dynamic environment. So thank you to Veronica Rose for introducing me to, to Gather Town. That's certainly one way. Um, but yeah, I mean, just find people that you can, uh, that you can share life with, that you can enjoy different, different things with, whether, whether it is video games or, uh, like, uh, I love right now on, on VR, uh, walk about mini golf, <laughs> go, go find somebody that you can play mini golf with on, on the VR headset. Um, because you're going to laugh, you're going to smile and, and you're going to have a good friendship that comes out of that. Well, I like the fact that you say that it doesn't necessarily have to be a LinkedIn or a Slack with these platforms that are much more professional, quote unquote, professional based, where it's really, you can find a community to enhance your life anywhere. I mean, I, I do love LinkedIn, but I, I would be lying if I told you that the, <laughs> even, even a fraction of the percentage of people that I'm connected with on LinkedIn are, are people that I'm close to. I'm, 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 I'm not going to LinkedIn to generate a depth of, of relationship. I, I am going to LinkedIn personally more for that exposure element and, and just kind of getting out there, but trying to identify and attract people that, that I can bring into my tribe <laughs> and, and that I'll, I would be very excited to, to be quote unquote friends for life with. Uh, but then, you know, we're going to, we're going to quickly morph that relationship beyond and outside of LinkedIn. You've, and, and this is why I wanted to talk to you is because you've been unbelievably successful at nurturing this community that you needed to find outside of your regular gig. So of that, mm -hmm. what is the number one benefit that you would say for you personally in having built this network? Well, I mean, I've, I've just gotten to do more of the things that I love to do. I, I love to speak. I love to write and I love to train. Th those are the things that I, I really love I think I especially love training. I mean, when I'm in a classroom of 15, 20 people and, and even a virtual environment where I'm, I'm just getting to go deep with a small group of people on, on important CX topics, I come out of that on fire. I love those days, but I, I also love having opportunities to speak and do webinars and, and things like that. I mean, being on this podcast with you, Russell, I love doing this. It's such a fun conversation and I would never get to do these things were, were it not for the steps taken early on um, to create that network and to forge those connections. I love that as a wrapper upper. So I'm going to wrap it up with the, <laughs> the capper. The last question I ask every single one of the relationships at work podcast guests, which is Nate Brown. What's one simple action people can do right now to improve their relationships at work. Think about that one individual that you are have not been connecting with <laughs> and and take take a little bit more personal responsibility in that and think about how you can forge a better connection with that individual maybe maybe you've written them off uh, maybe there's a lot of frustration maybe there's been a lot of selfishness that that has occurred on on their side but i mean one one thing that i was mulling over in the car the other day is if if you're a kind person but you're only kind to certain types of people, then you're not a kind person. <laughs> so, so challenge yourself to be kind and to be better to people that you don't perfectly gravitate towards, that, that it's not convenient for you. It's not easy for you. Challenge yourself to be kind there and to go deeper into that relationship because you will come out of that smarter with, with a, a deeper, fuller perspective 
and it will enhance not only that relationship, it will probably enhance a lot of relationships in your life. That there is Nate Brown, Senior Director of CX at Arise Virtual Solutions and co-founder of CX Accelerator, a community he co-founded himself. So the man knows of what he speaks when it comes to that networking thing. Thank you so much, Nate. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>